Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the Versus Stars podcast. All my loyal listeners, thank you for your continued support. And remember, click the subscribe button, everybody. This is a very special episode because Paul Sung Young Lee boards the Muller ship. You know him as Captain Carson Teva in The Mandalorian. You will see him soon as Uncle Iroh in Avatar The Last Airbender on Netflix. Come aboard as we go traversing the stars. Hi, Mr. Lee. Thank you so much for coming to Versus Stars Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's totally my honor, sir. It's, it's, I've really been looking forward to this conversation, so thank you for coming on. Thanks. Don't call me sir, please. That's like, <laughs> You make <laughs> me feel so old. Just call me Paulie. I'll go, I'll go with Paul. Yeah. Um, so I always start with a question of inspiration. So what inspired your love for acting and who are your earliest influences? Oh, my God. Uh, you know what? Growing up, I didn't even know I could be an actor, to be, to be honest, because um, it was just... My parents had just never gave me that option. You know, growing up, it was just like immigrant parents. And they said, you could be five things in life, doctor, lawyer, engineer, teacher, or a failure. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it was just one of those things. And uh, I didn't really discover theater um, or acting that I could do it until university. It just seemed like fun. I just saw this, uh, the university drama program at the uh, University of Toronto, uh, university college drama program at the University of Toronto. And, um, you know, I applied for it because it sounded like fun. And, um, you know, I got in and I fell in love with the craft of acting and, and sort of never looked back. So there was that. I mean, but growing up, I, a number of different, I had a number of different favorite actors growing up. You know, uh, Roy Scheider was one of them, Steve McQueen, mm. um, you know, these great things, uh, uh, you know, Gary Oldman as I got older as well. And, and just like really fantastic character actors like Paul Giamatti before he made it big too, right? So, uh, the, there was never there was never a shortage of, of inspiration, uh, inspirational actors um, that were non-Asian. There were a ton of them non-Asian, but then, <laughs> you know, it was one of those things where you, that's one of the reasons why I didn't know I could be an actor is because mm. I didn't or, or I wasn't aware of any successful in North America, at least Asian performers. Right now, there's mm. there's many, many of them. Right. But uh, I mean. I was so happy when I, you know, when I, when I discovered who Chow Yun Fat was back in the university days. Like, oh my god! And and then you know that's kind of he was kind of my, my my gateway sort of guy there. And then when I started to discover South Korean actors whom I absolutely adored um, and still adore, like Che Min Sik and uh, Song Kang Ho and all those really really great performers. Then then you know the world starts to open up a little bit now, and with the advent of the internet, you know everything shrunk, so you get more access to international stars and uh that that's been the great equalizer in my opinion but like yeah growing up yeah didn't have a ton didn't have a ton of good examples well i mean south korean television has done really well on netflix i mean squid games oh um, yeah all of us are dead those are fantastic series yeah yeah 2020 mm -hmm. i grew up during 1970 you know 1975 you know 1977 there weren't too many right so <laughs> That that that's the thing, and it's great to see that actually, um, you know, especially with Korean immigrant parents, who are the one thing about Korean the Korean people are they're fiercely proud proud of their origins, and so whenever there is a success story, they will celebrate, which is fantastic. So when you gave, um, like you said, your parents gave you a list of five things you could do, you obviously didn't chose those five. Were no. they? Uh... Excited that you didn't choose it, or were they like, "Oh crap"? They weren't happy. No, they weren't happy. They weren't happy. But you know, what are you gonna do? It's it's one of those things where they never actively tried to block me. You know, they didn't. They they couldn't. First of all, but I mean, um, I think for them, the whole reason they immigrated to to Canada was to give myself and my sister a be better chances, uh, more opportunities. And I get it as a parent now, like you sacrifice so much to give your mm. kids these great opportunities. And when they don't, when they take that opportunity or that, that, that beautiful gift and they, they go off in a direction that you're kind of like, hmm, what? <laughs> uh, I get it. I get it. But it is one of those things where, you know, one of the reasons um, they moved here was to give us choice, to have more of that choice. And so, my sister and I, it, it was just one of those things. And I went off the beaten path and uh, it was difficult. My parents mm. were very worried. Uh, They're more worried that I was going to, you know, uh, live in squalor, and, mm. you know, like be co completely impoverished. Um, So 
it was, you know, they they were just concerned about me, but things worked out. You know, I was uh, very fortunate in terms of um, all my hard work uh, paying off and and being ready for those opportunities, never knowing when they're going to come, but being ready to capitalize them on them uh, was a great thing. So, you know, everybody's got a different path, um, and it's our lives, and we we need to live them in a certain way. And and just I do that with my kids. There are certain choices that they make that I look at and scratch my head and go, hmm, I don't know if that's the best choice, but at the end of the day, it's their lives. Mm. And, uh, you know, they have to deal with the consequences as well. Uh, but we're always there uh, as, a, as a safety net or a backup up to a certain point. So well, that's the sign of a good parent, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you want to make, you want to equip your children so that they make good choices. Um, and at the same time too, you can't do everything for them because they're never living their own life. And in fact, you're in essence really sort of like hobbling them and, and not letting them be independent. I think independence for children is difficult as it is, especially for this generation of helicopter parents. Mm. Um, you got to let them go. You got to let them fall. You got to let them fail because that's how they learn. Those are the best yeah. lessons. I mean, we can, we can, <laughs> you know, I can lecture, I can yell, I can scream, we can do all these different things, but really it's not until they fail on their own and pull themselves themselves out of it that they really learn. And so that's why for me, I don't see failure uh, as a dirty word or something that is like, oh, horribly negative. It's like, no, failures happen for a reason and we learn from them. Uh, it's how we deal with these failures and how we move forward and the lessons we learn from them that are important um, because not everybody succeeds all the time. Mm. And you attended uh, University of Toronto, correct, for their dramatic uh, acting lessons. Now, is that different than the acting schools that are in the States? And was it difficult to transition from Canadian TV and film to the States? Well, no, I mean, the craft of acting is pretty much, you know, it, it's it's like the game of baseball. You can play baseball in Canada. It's the same sport in Canada, the United States, anywhere in the world. The game is the same, right? The skill sets are the same. Um, the scale of it might be a little bit different, mm. right? Um, and so, you know, the U.S. in terms of acting... Uh, in terms of just like storytelling and uh, the industry is gigantic compared to the one in Canada, right? It was just mm. the, the 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 sheer number of shows and the scale of the shows and the money that's involved is completely different. But the actual job itself is very similar, right? So you start off with the with the um, sort of the foundation and the, of the craft, and uh, you're going to U of T. I mean, that for me was I was trained primarily as a theater actor, not film or TV. And again, the the craft is the same, but the technical requirements are a little bit different because on stage, obviously, you've got a full body. You've got to use your entire body. You've got to use your voice. You have mm. to be very in tune physically and vocally to reach, you know, the third row uh, in, in, in the balcony at the very back. Right. Um, whereas on television, you have cameras, you have microphones, you have everything that's set up. Um, you know, things are shot in piecemeal. So technically, the requirements are different and you need a slightly different skill set but when it comes to the actual craft of acting it should be the same you're you're playing a character you've got needs wants desires motivations you've got you know the scenes that are broken down into beats and uh you've got scene partners and you discuss and rehearse and you know you have the outside eye with the director coming in to help you all out so that's all pretty much the same is the fixings can be different sometimes and the scale can be different so doing a show in canada really i mean a set is a set uh, I I go to a set in Canada and I'm working on like say Kim's Convenience. You know we've got a smallish crew, maybe 200 people. Then I go to the Mandalorian and there's like 500 people, 600 people, right? And the the size of this uh, of the sets are are way bigger. And you know there's way more money involved, but it's also a VFX heavy show. And so like th that's different. Those worlds are different. But a crew is a crew. You still have you know camera crews. You got focus pullers. You have props department. You have grips. You have the electrics, you have, you know, everybody running around. It's it's just bigger and there's more of them. Um, so it wasn't that much uh, of a of a jump up. I mean, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit different. But really, there's a familiarity to to any sort of set in North America, I would wager. And um, yeah, I mean, some of the lingo is a little bit different. Uh, but you learn that. But that's the same in, in you go to any city and they'll call, you know, sometimes it's just a dialect that they use. Or, or nicknames for something, you know, um, like the tube in London is the sub. We call it the subway here, right? So it's, it's just like that, but it's pretty, it, it functions the same way. But, um, you know, just, it's just doing the work. 
just doing work. So it's it's not when you get down to brass brass tacks, it's not that much different. Now, when you think about theater versus um, TV or film, as you mentioned, the idea of edit versus stage, how difficult is continuity in acting from film and TV? Because obviously with theater, you're starting from the beginning of the character's yeah. arc. You're going to end where, where it ends. In yeah. film, you might be shooting the end of your character's arc, the very beginning, yeah. you know, and so forth. So how do you handle um, con character continuity? Yeah, that's, that's a great challenge, actually, for film and TV. And it's a great question just because, um, you know, for theater you rehearse. That's that's a lovely part of theater. You rehearse all the way through, you break it down, and you've got that arc of the play. And you start from the beginning, and you go right to the end. And it's it's you just go. You make a mistake, you just go. You deal with it, and you go. And it, there there is that lovely linear sort of progression. Whereas on film and TV, you're right, it's piecemeal. Um, sometimes you have to shoot a really intimate, awkward scene, uh, or a scene with, with your scene partner. Uh, I did a Christmas movie for Hallmark uh, a couple of years ago with a wonderful actress by the name of Catherine Henna Kim. And she played my daughter and we had to have the first scene and I just met her and we had to have this heart to heart about how her, you know, her mom and my wife left her. And it was just like, Oh, it was really hard um, because we had to be, it was my character opening up his heart and talking right. to his daughter and stuff. And we kind of wished we'd been able to do that even the second day, because, you know, after that we got to know each other and then we felt a lot more comfortable and so there is that challenge of that, you know, having to shoot things out of order and and keeping in mind where your character is tracking and where they are at that mm. particular moment. And the other thing about editing, um, have, doing an edited performance is you do a number of takes and your performance can be shaped by whoever is editing the footage. And they can, it, it's amazing because they can change your intention. You could be playing one thing and they'll edit it in such a way where a certain line gets omitted and they'll use another take and all of a sudden your performance is pushed in another direction. And, and that can work, that, that can be really brilliant or it can be really humbling at the same time, right? Because it's one of those things where it's out of your hands. Uh, as right. a performer, you give you give all the different variations that the director asked for and the showrunner uh, and the producer, and then they stitch it together. Um, and so that's there is that challenge there of being engaged. So you have to really be on top of where your character arc is, which means you got to do more homework, right? And because you're going to be jumping around a lot more. Uh, but one of the benefits of that is too, uh, if you make a mistake, you can just go back, right? And mm -hmm. then you also have the benefit of the technological advantage of having a camera push right in. So you can really, really convey emotion or thought or intention just through that, just, just at an extreme close up. Whereas on stage, it's very hard to be intimate in that way. And you've got to be very, very, not broad, but big. Mm. Uh, and you, you know, so, so you lose a little bit of that intimacy sometimes just for acoustic sake sometimes, or because it's such a small moment, the person at the very back of the theater won't be able to see it. So, you, you know, you, th there are um, pluses and minuses for both sides. Now, from talking to different actors, I find that there seems to be a philosophical difference in how they approach, especially TV and film. It, like you said, there's multiple edits about multiple um, cuts they can try. Some people would like to keep the same tr attempt, the same um, approach every single time. Some like doing multiple different types of uh, takes. So what is your opinion? Do you think it's better to do different takes each time or do you think to do one take and see which one goes best? Yeah, no, well, I, I think in the end, it really sort of depends on the director as well, right? There's a collaboration between uh, performer and director and the director's got the overall vision of it. And, you know, con uh, consistency is great, is a good thing to have. And you perform a scene as rehearsed. And there's sometimes you find little nuggets in a scene where you kind of go, oh, and it's very intriguing. And they want to play with a variant of it. And they kind of go, this is great. We've got that in the can. Give us a very, like, let's play up this moment that we kind of discovered by accident or, um, and, and let's see what that takes us. And sometimes it's gold and sometimes it doesn't go anywhere. But I think one of the lovely things is when you give those multiple take the different takes where there's a variety of choice in there, it doesn't handcuff the director into a, mm -hmm. into just one 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 line. Uh, options are always good. Now the balance for that though is you've got to get, have a really good director who's got a, a just as an equal uh, sense of the the character that you're playing and, and tracking that arc too. So it's not a mess and it doesn't go all over the place in the edit. And uh, as well, there is such a thing as just sort of like, you know, performing a scene to death, 
when mm. you do so many takes and they're all different. It, what em, what ends up happening is you get kind of fatigue of the scene. And, you know, if you're doing multiple takes of a scene and you've got different coverage happening and you do the scene again and again and again, it just starts to lose a bit of that energy, that spontaneity, a little bit of that life just because you're just doing it, you know, a bunch of times and it's fatiguing. And if mm. I've been there on a set where the director is very much like, boom, that's exactly what I want. Thank you so much. Next setup. And everybody goes, but then they're hemmed in if it doesn't work. Yeah. Or if a producer says, oh, let's, let's, like, is there another, an alternate take that we can put in? It's like, no, I saw it going in this direction. And I've seen it where the directors were absolutely spot on. They go, that's great. And there've been other times where it's like, well, we need reshoots because we miss, we need this one moment from the scene mm. that could have been covered while we're shooting. But, you know, so it all depends on the uh, how simpatico I think the producers and the director are and the actors in, in terms of where they want that the story to sort of go. Mm. Well, you now appear uh, or have recently appeared in both The Mandalorian and The Book of Boba Fett. So things are looking very bright. Your parents should be very, must be very proud. <laughs> um, so how do you get involved in these projects? And were you already a Star Wars fan? Oh, I've been a Star Wars fan since I was five years old. So that's uh, <laughs> this is a dream come true for me. Um, I was actually uh, asked to be on on uh, The Mandalorian. I didn't have to audition for it, which is great. They offered me a role. But a lot of this sort of stemmed back to, again, there was a show I did earlier on in my career um, called Kim's Convenience that really sort of put, uh, put me on the map. And uh, Dave Filoni, who was one of the executive producers and the showrunner and co-writer and, you know, one of those big guys, Lucasfilm. Anyways, uh, so he was made aware of the show by his wife and he really enjoyed my performance in it and uh, it turned out we both had a, an acquaintance in common um so deborah chow who's a director on uh mandalorian season one and later on became like an executive producer and a director and co-writer i think for book of not book of boba fett uh obi-wan kenobi that was her mm. series um i knew deb from way back in the day back in toronto because she's canadian mm. and we worked together at the factory theater for you know a couple of weeks and uh, she was, when I knew her, she was, um, uh, she wanted to be a filmmaker and I wanted to be an actor. I was just out of school and she was, wanted to get into film school. And uh, she asked me if I wanted to be in a short film of hers. We shot for a day in Chinatown in, in Toronto and then she disappeared. <laughs> and the next time I saw her, she was, you know, she jumped in front of me in Los Angeles in like 2018 at the Unforgettable Gala uh, at the Beverly Hilton. And she said, hey, do you remember me? And it was like, Deb, yes, absolutely. How are you? And she told me she was working on The Mandalorian and that she was trying to get in touch with me because Dave Filoni was a fan of my work. And one thing led to another. I got a set visit. I got to see Deb work. I got to meet John Favreau and Dave. Uh, I got to see Dave do some work. I saw Grogu for the first time uh, before anybody else. Um, almost died of, of just like sheer excitement. And I had to <laughs> hold that and keep that secret for about a year. Um, and then, yeah, six months later, get a phone call from my agent saying, hey, you know, um, Lucasfilm called and they want to know your availability. And uh, I was like, yeah, I'm available. Like I will. And I keep saying this, man, I will burn down force. I will kidnap pets. <laughs> I will do anything. And I thought I was going to be under all this latex and no one's going to be able to see who I am. I thought it was going to be a creature or something. And uh, turned out, you know, they, they wanted me as an X-Wing pilot. And so that was, I mean, wow. When your dreams come true, it's 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 just like this ridiculous <laughs> sort of Cinderella feeling. And mm. and I, I think I must have cried at least a dozen times uh, on set, wardrobe fitting, in my dressing room. <laughs> you know, all these, it's just because you can't believe you're part of it, finally. You know, especially when you've been a fan mm. since you were a little kid. Um, and uh, yeah, and then they liked it enough that uh, they asked me back to do more. And so that that's a huge compliment, I think. And and I really want to prove that I could do the work. I, even though I'm a massive fanboy, I'm also a professional. This is my craft, and I wanted to mm. prove that I belong. So, Well, I feel like the, a good moral for that story is don't be an asshole to anybody. You know, I, you, you did your job. I, Deborah liked you. Things connect. people, And, and suddenly you're in Star Wars. <laughs> I think in general, that's a great, like, not just for this, but in life, just don't be an asshole. Uh, I mean, it's not hard. It really isn't hard 
to not be an asshole. <laughs> it, it's it's very simple. It's a very sim simple tenement. And there are a lot more people nowadays with a very strict no assholes policy. And it's <laughs> happening in the business because life is too short to have to work with an asshole. So yes. there you go. <laughs> well, like I said, you uh, play, I'm going to get the name wrong. Captain Carson Teva. Hey, you Captain. got it. Bang on. Hey, there it is. Uh, uh, which I, I would, like I said, I'm a fan of the show, so you think I, I would be able to pronounce it correctly. Um, but anyways, so what were you talking about the character upon um, receiving the role? And did you already know it was going to be a recurring character? No, I had no idea. Um, they, they use code names the, you know, they, for everything. Code names, code names, code names. I mean, I think Mandalorian, the production code name was Huckleberry. Um, my code name for my character was Foodie Pilot. And I'm naive, right? Like, I'm like, I, I didn't know. Like, we don't have code names in Canada because the scale is so small. There's right. no need, right? And so I took it quite literally. I was like, Foodie Pilot? What the hell is he? Does he drive some kind of a galactic food like <laughs> ship or something? Like, is he one of these dudes? Uh, like, uh, you know, you, you see in the Fifth Element where you've got that that junker comes down and he serves food out of the side mm. or whatever. I didn't know. And then I found out, oh, no, 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 he's a... He's 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 an X-wing pilot. He's a captain for the New Republic, and I was like, "Whoa, that's so cool!" Um, and uh, yeah, so so John and Dave they gave me a call uh, and explained the character to me, uh, what he was like and what, the way they thought he was going. And initially, it was just two episodes, and uh, that was it. And I thought, okay, yeah, I can do this. Two episodes it was great. Mm. Um, we shot the two, and I, you know, if that was gonna be it. That was going to be it. Like, at the very least, what I was telling myself is you made it. You got to be on a Star Wars show. And no one can take that away from you. And I was just, like, nerding out. So happy. Um, and then, you know, you wait that year. And you, because the further away you get from the shooting, the less real it seemed. It's more like a dream. And then, you know, the episode drops. And, uh, you know, my phone explodes. And everybody's losing their minds because I didn't tell anybody I was on it. <laughs> And, uh, you know, back home, I live in Toronto, so the media went absolutely apeshit. Um, they're asking for interviews and stuff. I'm like, fuck, guys, <laughs> what? Uh, and that's when you you realize that, yeah, shit, Star Wars is a big fucking deal. Yes. Um, people really, like, that's big news, especially when a Canadian gets on the show. And, and then, you know, like a Canadian who plays, like, a, a beloved role, like a character, like Appa from Kim's Convenience is on Star Wars. That makes news. Um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 humbling, it's flattering, it's joyful, it's all these things, but at the you know, really it's it's quite surreal because mm. it's sort of like, you know, if you got suddenly the media called you and like, hey, Mike, like we want to interview you because you did your job. Right. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of a little bit weird in that sense. Um, but it, it I mean, for me, it's just uh, it's unbelievable. It really is quite unbelievable. Uh, and I feel like I'm living in a dream sometimes because it's been, I've been living my best life mm -hmm. and I've been so, it's so ridiculously joy bringing being on that set and being a part of that universe. And like with season three, with my character being given a lot more to do in terms of helping to drive the narrative um, and, and to do more and to just show I can do more as a performer as well is, is just, Holy crap, man. My five-year-old is dying of joy inside of me, right? Like, he's just like, ah! So it's amazing. It's an amazing feeling. And uh, I, I try not to take it for granted mm. ever. Uh, and, the you know, to, to express gratitude for it and uh, to do my best not to fuck it up is another <laughs> big thing too, right? So, Well, I mean, the thing about Star Wars, once you're in Star Wars, it's sort of like Star Trek as well, where once you do it, you're – immediately and infinitely famous forever you know i mean is that is there a lot of pressure there for you knowing like like i said fans of these franchises never let you go once you do it you're then yeah. you're, you're, you're one of them forever well i know I, and what helps is i am a fan too right so i get right. that like i've been a fan of star wars so i like i understand inherently uh how the fan base reacts and that's another sort of thing as a performance like i don't want to fuck this up i want to make mm. sure everybody feels like i'm authentic and i belong in that universe that i'm not just some sort of like dude they they stunt cast from kim's convenience as a canadian and just sort of dropped in right mm. i wanted to make sure that hey no he walks a walk he talks a talk um and for me 
you know, doing Kim's convenience as well, um, help me in terms of like, just like how to treat fans. Mm. Um, being a fan myself, I know how easy it would be to make me happy. And mm. so that's where it stems my, my, my interaction with the fans. Um, you know, the fact that I, I am, I, I put the fans up, not on a pedestal, but I'm grateful to the fans because I know mm. without the fans shows are nothing. Mm -hmm. They choose to bring make these shows really, really big. And just as easily, they can choose to make them really small and make them disappear, too. Uh, and so I have an utmost respect for fans. And I think the fans should be treated with a certain amount of reverence and mm. respect and love, really, uh, is what it is. And so coming into Star Wars, I felt nothing but love from the fans, which I really, really quite appreciated. And for me, it's it's that re reciprocity. It's like, give me the love. I'm going to give it to you back because, and and the other thing is too, so you're going to accept the love. You got to accept some criticism as well, right? You can't, mm -hmm. it can't be just too one-sided. So it's that walking that balance as well. Um, But I, I, I mean, that's one of the lovely things about the fandom is they will elevate you to that status. Uh, and if you stay true to them, they'll stay true to you, right? And mm -hmm. so it's, it's like, that's 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 what makes these franchises so great are the fans right yes um and you know it can also it's a double-edged sword sometimes it can be one of the things that really makes it hard to mm. be in it too right like if the fan base turns on you yeah. or a very small vocal subset of those fans turn on you it can be i mean it's not all wine and roses i think i would gather i i would i would wage it's like 90 percent of the fandom is super fucking awesome and there's that 10% that they're kind of like, eh, you just kind of want to watch a world burn a little bit, right? Yeah. But I think everything is like that. In life, everything is like that. And um, I choose to focus on the positivity of the fans because they don't get enough credit sometimes, right? It's mm. easier to go negative and get those hate clicks going. Uh, but I, I choose to ignore that. It's like, yep. that's, you know, you're getting, you're getting paid to throw shade. I'm going to go and I'm going to go where the love is too. And it's a lot more even keeled because the fans that I know and I love and respect are the most generous, mm. passionate, intelligent, and kind people I've met. Right. And so um, that that's the one thing that's, and that's a huge honor as well to be, to have people look up to the character, really enjoy the character, reach out and let me know uh, that they, that they're enjoying the character. So I, I yeah, I don't take that responsibility lightly, but I accept it. Uh, I accept it, and I tried to do my best by that and by the fans. Um, yeah, it's okay. I'm actually going to read a, qu a quote of yours from CBC News. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. So the quote you said is: "A Korean Canadian in the Star Wars universe gives hope to a lot of people that dreams do come true, that this is attainable, that Star Wars is in a nutshell for me." Can you expand on why representation franchises like Star Wars is so important? Yeah, I mean, the, because it's a global phenomenon. It reaches every part of the planet where there's, you know, technology. People know what Star Wars is, no, no matter where you go. Or even if they haven't watched it, they kind of go, yes, I know Star Wars, right? Like, it, it is known. And so you have generation upon generation of children watching these stories and growing up. I'm part of the first wave, right? OG, 1977, five years old. I'm in the theater with my dad, with my sister, this franchise has been part of my life since I was five years old. And I saw, mm. I've seen every bit of stuff that's out there, but it isn't until recently that I ever saw somebody who looked like me. Yep. And that makes a big difference. Representation does matter. And I'm not saying you got to turn everybody this way or this. No, just more inclusivity. It's a galaxy for crying out loud. I, mm. I, I think about that. The permutations, it is a galaxy. It's not the Swedish all-star team. It is a galaxy of races, of shapes and colors and droids and organics and all these different things. There's a plethora of characters that can be developed uh, on that that can be just as compelling and just as interesting. I mean, some of our favorite characters are droids, right? And so don't tell me you cannot cast a person of color in a significant role to help push a narrative instead of like just window dressing. I mean, and at the end of the day, right? That kind of representation makes a difference to all the kids growing up because then they see somebody who looks like them on the screen and they mm. kind of go, ooh, that's so cool, right? And it just really what it does is when you make a fan base even bigger, that's better. 
yeah. right? Like, why are you? Why would you gatekeep and and keep it to a small miserly group of people who don't want to share that joy? Like, that's I, I think there's something a little bit like you got to question what your motivations are. Like, if your self worth is tied into your hoarding of this kind of information or or uh, fandom, it, it's sad because if I love something and I I, I want people to know why I love it. And I want them to love it too. And I want to share that love and I want to go and I want to, I want to learn too. I learned so much stuff from a lot of fans and I've grown up with this, but I'm, I'm learning tons from fans as well. And I love that mm. because that's what keeps something like Star Wars relevant. It's what keeps it fresh. You know, it, all these things, when I hear people scream and moan about like, ah, it's not like the original trilogy. It's like, yeah, well, they're still there. Go watch them by right. all means. Star Wars is big enough that it can sustain all these different narratives, all different types of storytelling from Andor to like the for the Tales of the Young Jedi. You can have that progression of sophistication in storytelling for different age groups. It doesn't just have to be linear and monolithic in its way. Right. And it's just like I don't understand why anybody would want to tie their self-worth into something that they're just consuming as stories. Right. People who are angry enough about like, oh, I wouldn't have done this. It's like, then go make your own <laughs> stories. Like, by all means, go make your own stories. But don't, you know, don't yuck somebody else's yum in right. that way. And um, and I think, and and that's the other great thing about stars is it, it ignites that, that amount of passion. Yeah. I think what we've lost as a society is that little, well, that bit of civility. Where yep. you can disagree with somebody, you can have that spirited conversation and not turn it personal and not get nasty and not be you're either with me or against me. That is an absolutely ridiculous way of thinking in life. And look at where it's gotten us. Right. So I that's why I preach unity, man. You can absolutely, if you think The Last Jedi is a pile of garbage, I will disagree with you. And I go, you know what? I love that movie. And we can have a conversation about it. And you can think, well, he's crazy or he's wrong. That's fine. But if you start to attack me personally because that's what I like, that's something wrong with you. Uh, right. and, and that's the thing, right? Like, we, this is what fandom is about. It's about hearing different perspectives, perhaps going, oh, okay, okay. And like, and just, I don't know, growing. Yeah. I, I think it's okay for people to like things and not like other things. I don't think everybody should like the same thing. That's what makes us interesting as human beings, right? Is that again, ooh, diversity. Look at right. that. <laughs> diversity. And, well, so well, I, I I often have argued with people online because I guess I have some free time. Um, <laughs> and, and, and 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 what I what, what I point out to them is if you like Star Wars, there's a reason why the villains, the Empire, all look the same and the rebels are diverse. He was trying to make a point to you. Right. <laughs> Luke is, is making a point to you that look, diversity is the good guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, and and that's you know, and at the end of the day, what I like to point out when especially when it gets really heated and people get nasty, it's like, dudes, this is a it's a makeup story <laughs> with, about guys who are wizards and in plastic space armor. Like really, with all that's going on right now, you're gonna tie your wagon to this and you're gonna you're gonna that's that's a hill you're gonna die on. Okay, okay, <laughs> right? it's just like it's, it's it's a movie, guys. It, it's you know so. Maybe we should just all take a breath and, and step right. back. It's something that we love absolutely to be passionate about. But at the end of the day, you shouldn't be like, you know, trying to dock somebody online because you disagree with their their, their hot take on what Last Jedi means. You know, so. <laughs> right. I, I agree with you 100%. Now, another cool thing that you got to do in while well, making The Mandalorian is that you got to have scenes with Din Jaren. Now, I know sometimes Pedro Pascal is in the suit. Sometimes he's not. Was he on set with you when you were shooting those scenes, uh, especially the, the last scene of um, The Mandalorian? No, no. All my scenes that I shot were with uh, a wonderful human being by the name of Brendan Wayne. Uh, he is, he's my brother. I love him. He makes me laugh all the time. Um, you know, he's just like, he's one of those really, really cool dudes that just has such a joy when it comes to work. And he's wearing that, he's wearing that hot, heavy costume. He's got that helmet on. And, you know, he's going through it. And Latif Crowder, I don't want to, I don't want to, um, you know, downplay his role, but Latif wasn't there because Latif does a lot, a lot of the physical, like the stunt work and stuff. Right. And Brendan is there uh, for more of the acting stuff. Right. Like, um, and, uh, you know, the two of them are tremendous. 
but uh no i i my scenes were with with uh brendan um and uh i think because pedro was off this season he was shooting the last of us mm. like physically it was very difficult for him to be in two places at once <laughs> Go figure. Um, but I have been on set with Pedro uh, during season two. He was there in the suit. And uh, what a lovely, lovely man. I mean, just, I, I can't say enough about how awesome he was. He was very, very kind to me. Very funny, uh, very open, and very generous with his time. And, you know, I've been on sets where the number one is not as nice, is not as generous, is not as you know, all these things. And uh, you appreciate that. And you know that as, you know, as an actor who comes and visits many sets, like the, I learned uh, when I got my opportunity to be number one on the call sheet for Kim's convenience, uh, how I wanted to behave and how I wanted to sort of the tone that I wanted to set on, mm. on, on the show. And that was Pedro. He set that tone. So it's, yeah, he's a great guy, really, really happy for all he's achieved. What a talent. And uh, yeah. Really great, kind human being, too. Well, well, we're playing against someone who's in the Mandalorian armor. Now, I know as an actor, some of your acting comes from the reactions of whoever you're acting across from. Now you got the big helmet. There's nothing. You're not saying anything. Does that, does that, does that have an impact? Does that affect no. you at all? Not for me. Uh, they had that one. They have this one study. Uh, and it's the thing with neutral mask, right? Uh, where the neutral mask, actually, and audiences do that. When you see just this one sort of shape, and it doesn't change expression, as audience members, we endow that mm. mask with our own sort of reactions. And we go, oh my God, he's very sad. And it's like, no, you can't really tell that because all the context is telling you and you're projecting that onto that mask. Mm. And so audience can go, wow, they can really act through that mask. And there's, there's a bit of that to it, but a lot of it we help as audiences to, to endow that sort of particular set of emotions on that 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 neutral mask. And it's the same thing with acting. And, you know, Brendan's under there too. And it's him. And he's saying the lines. And he's, you know, he's doing his job as a performer to give me as much as he can. Mm. But at, at the end of the day too, right? It's a two-hander. We're working together. Uh, I endow whatever he's giving me based on what I'm hearing. And it's great. And we have a director who comes in. It was a Peter Ramsey and, and uh, Rick Famuiwa. Who came in and you know they give us redirections and stuff like that but it's like uh it, it's 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 not as hard i don't find it that difficult now you know but again they weren't like super intimate scenes where mm. you know we, we were discussing it was just you know these are great scenes uh in chapter five where i'm just telling them hey look grief karga you need your help right like that's what carson does he just sort of reminds people of where they're from and what they need to do Right. It's like, I can't do anything, but, you know, I just tell you, your friend is in danger. And I thought you should know. Mm. Right. And it's that whole. Um, yeah. Very subtle between the lines of he's your friend. Right. Which spurs, which spurs him to action. And uh, so, yeah, just working that way with the helmet, with the mask. No, not a hindrance whatsoever. Now you had another good scene with, uh, I believe, uh, Tim Meadows, where he, uh, yeah. he plays Colonel Tuttle. Now, yeah. what I th now, as someone who's a Star Wars fan, this is why I found this, this scene so interesting. Because when you watch the original trilogy, you have the assumption that the New Republic is going to be like this perfect, you know, emerald castle on the hill. Everything's going to be yeah. perfect. And Tuttle is kind of, is a schmuck. Um, <laughs> you know, and... everybody hates him. Everybody's so <laughs> down on Tuttle, right? <laughs> and it, 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 it does tell you the New Republic isn't as shiny as you think it would be when it gets created. Is that something to be? Is that something to be said about bu bureaucracy? At, at, you know, at the very heart of it. Yeah, no, I think, and and it's one of those things where I think it's very, very true to life, in the sense that after a period of civil war in the galaxy. The New Republic is trying to be so unlike the Empire that they're they're going so far as to like destroy anything that was used during that period that was imperial, right? Like there's that scene where Dr. Pershing is it's like, oh, I'm going through all these manifests, and you're destroying all this equipment. It's it's real, it's still good equipment. And it's like, no, 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 no. The Empire uses equipment. So that equipment is evil. So we're gonna be getting rid of it because we're mm. not the Empire. And it's basically what they should have called themselves, the New Republic. We are not the Empire. Yeah. And they go to such ridiculous lengths to to sort of show everybody, no, 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 no. We we are so not them. We are we are fair. We are altruistic. We are this. We are that. But the problem is, 
it is it, it's just it's too overwhelming for them right mm -hmm. they when you're trying to be that have that level of egalitarianism it's it's almost impossible because you have a centralized think about it you have a you're trying to run an entire galaxy mm -hmm. through a centralized government of course you're going to be out of touch with what's happening in the outer rim because their needs are completely different from the ones mm -hmm. in the inner and mid rim right and so it, it, it's one of those things and it, it's it's happening to us right now it's right it's like all the big cities they need you know they produce a lot of the income so they need this they need that and the priority kind of goes to them whereas you know in the outskirts and the sticks where the farmers they have a whole different set mm. of of needs and wants and stuff and oftentimes they get ignored because there's fewer of them they don't have the voting numbers and so you create that animosity um, and the thing with the New Republic is, yeah, it's not all wine and roses because, you know, it's one thing when you can be a rebellion and you don't have to fill out paperwork. <laughs> you can just act and just go and do things. Here, it's like, oh, no, you're the standing government now. You have to account for every single credit that is spent because the taxpayers or the people are going to go, why Why are we paying so much? Right. Why is this? What's what's happening here? Why is there no oversight? Why do we need this? Why do we need that? Well, because if you want to be on the level and you want to be on the up and up, you have to be accountable for all those things. How do you do that? Paperwork and this and that. And it just gets to the point where guys like Tuttle get overwhelmed. And I'm sure, uh, I think people give him like a really bad rap. Uh, I love Tim Meadows. I loved his performance. Um, but he played the guy that's just been so beaten down by rules and regulations. Mm. He served in the rebellion. I'm sure he was like, great officer and then they just killed his spirit and crushed him with paperwork because he was about to green light Carson Tava going in with the Delphi squadron until you know Elliot Kane snakes her way in and goes oh they didn't sign oh this and that and he's like snapped back into this whole bureaucracy thing where he goes oh they didn't sign with the new republic we have other actual new republic systems that have committed themselves to the new republic. We can't help somebody who hasn't. How would it look to them? And that's that's the whole thing. Like if you really look at it, you go, yeah, he's got a point. It sucks. But mm -hmm. how would you feel if you if your system had signed on with the new republic? You were looking for aid, and he sends it off to an out, you know, a backwater planet. Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of go, well, what the hell? What? Why are we signed then? What? What are we doing? So it's that weird, horrible, real life scenario where there's just too much that has to be done and too little resources and you want to do the right thing but sometimes you just can't because you don't have you don't have the wherewithal to do it so i thought he played it brilliantly um you know people go oh he's a schmuck but i mean i think if you look pragmatically at where he's at what can he do what can he do so well, it's nice to know that even in the galaxy far, far away, office jobs suck. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Why Tava doesn't want to fill out reports, <laughs> right? Indeed. So I mean, were there discussions on set about those scenes being developed further in another season? Do we have any knowledge of Tava, what could happen or should happen and what's coming season four? No uh, idea. Uh, yeah. <laughs> four, if, if there is a season four, four. Uh, nothing's been said yet. I haven't heard anything. Um, I mean, it certainly feels that way with with the the deal that he's you know that last scene in season season three when he says you know he wants to work on the for the new republic on a case by case basis like under the table. Uh, certainly, it's being set up uh, that way. I'd love to be back a hundred percent. If <laughs> if they asked, I would like yes again. <laughs> I'll burn down forests. I will kidnap pets. I will do all those things. Um, but I haven't heard anything. And uh, I have no idea because that's above my pay grade. <laughs> uh, but I mean, if it were up to me, yes, <laughs> like, all those things, all those things. If it were up to me, sadly, it's not. So, well, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions of things that you probably can't answer either. So, if you, you can, you're welcome just to blow the the, the question off. Um, so, you're slated to appear as Uncle Iro in Avatar: The Last Airbender. Yo. So can you offer any information about it, updates or anything about it? Mm. It's a trap. That's what it <laughs> sounds like. Uh, I, I, what can I say? Um, I don't, okay, here's the thing. These are the questions that are asked most, most of all. When is it coming out? Answer, I have no idea. Um, <clears throat> I know they're working on VFX on it right now. 
Uh, it's they don't have a, a release date. Nobody's told me again above my pay grade. Um, and so all I know last I heard is they've done all the reshoots. They did them like last September for it, uh, but they're working on the VFX. And when you have a show where there's tons of bending going on, right? Earth, air, fire, and water. It's got to look right. It's got to be mm. impressive. It can't be underwhelming because really what's the point, right? This is something that's got to be done perfectly. And so they're working on that. Um, the other question I have is, uh, you know, what can I say about the scripts? It is an adaptation, uh, but it pays great homage to the source material. Uh, people who are fans of the animated series of book one, you'll know you'll see a lot of familiar storylines in there, a lot of familiar characters, but you'll also see that it is indeed an adaptation. So they're going to be introducing new themes, new characters, uh, some characters they're going to bring in a little bit earlier than, you know, than, than they did during the animated series. And that's not a bad thing. I think that's a great thing because if you're going to do a shot by shot remake of an animated series, what's the point? Just right. watch the animated series. Right. Um, and so there is that. What I can say is as a fan, and I'm a fan of that animated series too, it feels right. Mm. All the stuff feels right. There, there's a level of of respect and and reverence to the source material, but we're not slavish to it, if that makes mm. any sense, right? Like there are certain things, I mean, you hear it's it's not like a gritty reboot like like uh Riverdale. Where it's like that's not Archie Andrews. He's like this wholesome, like redheaded kid. And now he's having sex with everybody. It's not that. It's not like that at all. Um, it's a little bit more mature in the sense that, you know, hey, Avatar 2005 that was on Nickelodeon for kids, right? Yeah. This show, kids can watch it, but I'd wait till a little bit older. I mean, I don't know. I mean, the action is up there. The consequences, there, there's a lot of moving parts. And some of the themes are just, just a little bit deeper. I mean, it is for meant for older audiences, right? Not to say it's, it's explicit or anything like that, but I think it might be too intense for the same age group that initially watched it in 2005, right? And so they got to up it a little bit because it isn't a kid's show, right? Mm. Uh, I, I would say that the, the show that we're doing isn't geared towards kids per se, more of that tween and older sort of, audience uh and of yeah. course all the fans who watched it the og fans in 2005 they're now much older too right yep. so you know you gotta you gotta give the original fans a little something more meaty to chew on now i mean uncle iroh is, is one of my favorite characters in the show i know my wife um loves it as well um now when you're playing uncle iroh once again a, a very well-liked character how similar is your interpretation of the character to the one from the original cartoon that's a great question because it you know Big shoes to fill, huge shoes to fill. That this is a character that I have to approach with the same amount of reverence and honor. Uh, want to stay true to the foundation that was laid by the great late Mako, yeah. and of course uh, Greg Baldwin, who took over the voicing work for the character as written too. Um, but it's also he's not animated. The character I'm playing is a, is a live action version of him. Yeah. Um I have to bring uh my 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 craft, my skills of performing and some of my choices too to come in. Um but I think fans can rest assured I'm a fan of Iro as well, so it's not like I'm playing Iro as some like sleazy Lothario just for laugh. I'm not doing that. I'm staying true because really the core essence of of Iro is his heart and the love he has for his family. Mm. And I think the one thing that I really wanted to 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 focus on and concentrate on with Zuko, played by Dallas Liu, who is a treasure, uh, absolute fantastic young actor who cared so much about his portrayal of Zuko, was that relationship between the two of us, that give and take, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, Uncle Iroh, he has suffered a tremendous loss of losing Luten and would give anything to have him back again. And now he's got his nephew, who has been exiled by his brother. And so he's like that, that for me, that relationship was tantamount mm. to everything. Everything else is all just sort of gravy, but that relationship had to be real, had to be the fans need to know that Iroh loves Zuko. And so, you know, that's, that's what I focused on in terms of the other character stuff. Yeah, sure. You know, he's, he's, he's very, he can be very whimsical at times. 
Um, he's not overly serious. Uh, that being said, there aren't that many moments of levity. I didn't want Iroh to be like kind of a clown either, mm -hmm. right? Like it had to come out of a place of truth. And so I try to play it that way. Um, and I think uh, one of the, yeah, yeah. I mean, you'll see it when you see it. I, I'm excited. I haven't seen very much footage of it. Uh, if any, no, I haven't seen any of it. So all I can go on is is your feeling as a, as a performer when you leave uh, the set on the, after after certain takes, you kind of go, okay, that felt really good. That felt so it feels feels good. Um, well, maybe you can answer uh, these two questions, and if you, like I said, you can't jump them. Um, is Iro in more or is a bigger part of this series than he was from the cartoon? Or you have to say was this part expanded or shrunk? Um. I don't know. Uh, no, I mean, it feels about the same. I mean, so the episode, we shot eight episodes and they're an hour long. Yeah. And uh, if you look at book one, they're like 22 episodes, but they're half hour long. So if you do the math, it's like you, you shave about an hour off um, from, from the, you know, the, there's, there's an hour less of, of, of actual like time, screen time. But I mean, some of the side quests in book one are kind of, like they, you know, the not quote unquote filler episodes or whatever, those have been like, it's trimmed down. It's a very lean sort of like a muscular story that gets the ball rolling. Uh, I feel like he's, it's the same. It feels the same. I mean, again, this adaptation is, is closer to book one than a lot of people want to believe, okay. you know, um, there are certain story moments that are certain things aren't there because it's an adaptation because it, it wouldn't translate really well, but there are things that are there that when they, you know, the things that are there are expanded and they're just really made that much more, uh, meaty. So, um, yeah, I didn't, I don't feel like, yeah, Iro. I mean, I, I was doing, Iroh's pretty involved. He's pretty involved. Right. And it's just like, cause it's like the main, the main three characters is, you know, uh, Aang, Sokka, and Katara, and they're being chased by Zuko, right? And so you need Zuko chasing them, and I'm with Zuko. So as much as there is with Zuko, Iroh's there too. Now, once again, I'm not sure you can answer the question or not, but I'm going to just throw it at you. Um, once again, because of the fact that the original series already exists, we, everyone knows, you know, has the beginning and end, uh, we do know that um, there's a series as well, Legend of, of Korra as well, that came mm -hmm. after. When are you able, able to say anything about when this is being made? Is it made in such a way that people, they it's made that people they know the audience is, knows already about the storyline and potentially this Legend of Korra stuff? Is there, you know, what I'm saying like little not like little not Easter eggs but little oh, drops, oh, I see, connections? I see. Um, I don't know. You know, I I I honestly couldn't couldn't tell you. Uh, to be honest, I haven't seen Legend of Korra yet. So, uh, if there are little nods to it, I think really. What everybody wanted to focus on was just telling the story uh, and, and getting that first season down, right? Like, that's it. I mean, you can't look too far ahead and lay down little Easter eggs for what's going on in the future. Because if you're not focusing on the present, you're just going to miss what's going, like, well, why bother? Right, with, right. With, you know, you can just, so you need to stay focused. And that's the one, I think, priority for everybody uh, was to tell the story of book one in a most excellent fashion. Um, so I couldn't really speak to, I mean, everybody who was working on the show was a fan mm. as well. Right. And so they're, they're mindful of the fact that, yeah, fans know they're smart. They know where this is sort of going to, or where the other series, you know, the, the animated series went to, is the end game going to be the same? It, it is an adaptation. Mm. We are moving that direction, but there are certain things I think fans will see, well, they'll, they'll kind of go, Oh, so then is this going to happen or is mm. that going to happen? Like there, there is a bit of that in play as well. So, you know, again, this show uh, is an adaptation. It's got to have its own path to a certain extent as well. So. Is, was it done with the assumption that the next seasons will be made as well? Do you like, could you tell? I, I you know, just contract wise, um, you know, it, it's, they, they want to lock all the actors down. Um, mm -hmm. and so I, I think the hope is for it to go multiple seasons and to be able to do book two and book three, um, and perhaps further on, like if they want to, like going into Korra, I guess, um, or going off and telling more of the story, mm -hmm. uh, 
but uh yeah no i i like i again it's it's like mandalorian i haven't heard anything nobody said anything to me and again i think the way it is is it's like well let's see how season one goes and if people watch it and like it then then there's that discussion of how to proceed but i think right now they're all just focused on trying to get season one out so I that's say, speculation on my part because nobody tells me <laughs> well well, I was gonna say because I, I think like as a fan, you always have trepidation dealing with Netflix because they always have that like that quick trigger finger, like oh, stop, you know, don't do that. <laughs> right. Well, you know they they have they from what I hear, and again, they have an algorithm, right? They got to mm -hmm. hit the certain metrics, and they're they're good. At, I mean, and I think it's 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 business at yep. the end of the day. It's kind of a, it is a business, and they're not there to lose money. And it's like if the if a show is projected to make a certain amount and they don't make that return. It's like, do you throw more money into it and hope it gains an audience, right? Like, it, it's it's one of those strange, strange things, right? And so, uh, it, a show. I mean, how many times have we seen it where a show is critically acclaimed and it gets canceled after like a season or two? Yeah, people don't watch it. So that that's the thing. People have to watch it, um, and they have to like it. It's gotta hit those numbers. I have no idea what those numbers are. I don't know what the threshold is, but uh, you know. Well, this is a big show for Netflix, though. Well, so I for, think they, they, they. From what I from, from what I heard for for listeners, the goal apparently is you need to watch it the first day it's out. That's where the numbers really matter. Oh, so, really? So don't hold off on it. You you, you, you got to watch it when it first comes up if you really want to uh, get Netflix attention. You can't. Shit, man! Wait, yeah, watch it. it. Come on, guys. Right. Watch it. <laughs> right. Watch so it. Be, so get it as soon as it comes out. You got to start binging. Um, so um, <laughs> you're about to be part of these two iconic franchises. Yeah. Uh, what, you ready? Prepare for all this. I, you know, I, I'm kind of chomping at the bit to get going on this, right? Because it's like we we shot like Mandalorian season three. We shot in like November 2021, right? So like that that's a that's a year ago. Like uh, Avatar, we finished shooting in like June of 2022. Oh wow! So. You know, it's like it's gonna be more than a year again, and it's like I get it, but I'm like, let's go, let's go, right. because I'm, I'm, I, I love, I honestly, I love interacting with fans. I do, I do, I love it because it makes them happy and it makes me happy because I am a fan, yeah. And I know, I, I know what it makes, I, I know how it feels when somebody whose work you admired, uh, just acknowledges you. And has a chat with you. And I've tried to stay as, as grounded and as down to earth as I've, as I've always been. Um, and I say this a lot too. It's like I'm really happy that this kind of success has come to my in my life at such an, uh, a later part of my life. Uh, because I know how difficult it is to be out there and to be grinding mm -hmm. away and to try to get work and stuff. And so I appreciate this a lot more. And for me as well is I want to be an ambassador for these shows. I want the fans to know that they are appreciated and that they are loved. Mm -hmm. And this is the the message that I always want to bring out. And I, I want to create, help foster a community of uh, self, like of, of like respect and kindness and joy and spreading that joy mm -hmm. and lifting each other up instead of gatekeeping and tearing each other down. This is what I want. And I'm ready uh, to just go out and like meet a ton of people and like really, um, I, I feed off of their happiness. I feed off of it. It's great. It's like an emotional vampire, except like <laughs> you know, instead of the negative stuff, it's the positive stuff. And so, yeah. <laughs> well, Mr. Lee, when you're ready to talk about Avatar, I mean, uh, yeah, Avatar: Last Airbender, please come back on and talk about it. You've been an absolute pleasure to talk with, sir. And Aww. thank you so much. Thanks so much, Jeff. You too.